Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be going over the history and geography of Bangladesh or Bangladesh, depending on where you're from. This is another one of those countries that um, all the different places are pronounced differently depending on what dialect you use around the world. Um, I actually have a friend who is of Bangladeshi descent. Uh, shout out to my friend Benar who helped me with this video. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but Bangladesh is a really interesting country in that it has a lot of um, notable places geographically. Let me show you with my pencil. Um, let me move this book out the way. As always, we'll flip through a book at the end, show you some pictures, but um, the biggest obvious geographic highlight of the country would be its huge delta. And this is the world's largest delta. A delta being a space where uh, rivers open up and fork out to the sea. Um, this is called the mouth of the Ganges. Uh, because it is formed by the Ganges River, you can see going from here, meeting up with the Brahmaputra River. Um, in Bangladesh, this part of the Brahmaputra is known as the Jamuna, and the Ganges River is called the Padma. Lots of different, again, like, depending on where you're from, everything's different. Uh, but you can see the huge um, delta region down here opening up into the Bay of Bengal. Um, this area is very, um, low level. It's very near sea level. Um, it's very prone to flooding as well because Bangladesh does have a long monsoon season in the early springtime. So, um, there have been very notable floods, particularly in 1998 and 2017. Um, global warming is also a factor because of this. Um, you know, if the sea level rises just a few inches, all of this will be underwater. And many, many, many people live here. Actually, um, Bangladesh technically has, um, the largest, I forget how to phrase it, like the most, like, condensed population in the world. It's very, very populated. Um, because Bangladesh is over in the region of India. You can see the INA of India over here. It's bordered almost completely by India. This is India's border right here. And then just barely down here um, is a border with Myanmar. Um, and actually down here, hold on, down here, is it there? Let me find. Is it there? Kind of. You can almost see it. Um, chair is very squeaky tonight also. Sorry about that. Um, this town here, or city I should say, called Cox's Bazaar, is home to the world's longest beach. So we have the world's largest delta, the world's longest beach. It also has the world's largest mangrove forest, which is all down here, partly in India, but mostly in Bangladesh. It is called the Shundarban, which my friend uh, tells me means beautiful forest in Bangla. Um, I'm going to actually do a whole video on the Shundarban forest here because it is really fascinating, um, particularly that it's home to the Bengal tigers. And, um, look out for that video coming up soon so you can learn what makes these Bengal tigers that live here different from any other tigers in the world. I won't spoil it. <laughs> in terms of cities, um, there's the capital city right here in Dhaka. Another important city that um, that I want to note here is Chittagong over here. Very large port city. Um, it was um, the biggest um, trading port um, in this region of the world for a very long time. Very important for its history. Um, Bangladesh has some really successful exports. You might notice some of your clothes say made in Bangladesh. Uh, there is a big textile factory production here in Bangladesh. Um, their main export is actually jute, 
which is what like rope is made out of. So that's really interesting. They also had lots of tea and of course rice, you know, rice flourishes in this type of environment. Um, but they have, um, and have had for pretty much its entire history, a large export industry. And it's all because of this region over here with the wide delta, the rivers, and, um, its position in the world, um, you know, being right between the Middle East over here and then the Southeast Asian countries over there, right in the middle, perfect for trade. Um, let's just get into the history. That's a good point to get into it. So, um, where to start? I suppose way back in time in the Stone Age. 20,000 years ago, there is evidence of people in this region. Uh, rice cultivation started in the second millennium BCE, the people then. Um, in the third century BCE, we have evidence of the Pundra kingdom. In this region, we have um, writings from them, some of the earliest writings in the, pen <laughs> the region that is now Bangladesh. Um, the Greeks and Romans actually had um, some form of contact with this region. Um, according to a lot of their writings, this was home to the Gangaridae kingdom. It's actually, I just did, in my series, I just did Greece. Um, this is about as far as Alexander the Great got during his conquests. Um, according to the Greek historians, he came upon the, uh, the Gangaridae kingdom and was very intimidated by their amount of war elephants, combined with the fact that they were invading during monsoon season, was what made Alexander turn around and start heading back toward uh, Greece and Macedonia. Um, but all evidence we have of this kingdom literally just comes from Greeks and Romans. Um, but what we do know about the people during this time was that they were very, very Buddhist. Buddhism really exploded in this area. And there's lots of really cool ancient sites that pertain to Buddhism. Um, in particular, there's this monastery. Um, there might be pictures in here. I'm not positive. We'll find out. Um, a really cool, um, like, Buddhist ruin where a lot of, like, their apartments and things are still, um, not intact, but you can definitely tell that they were used for apartments and sleeping quarters and things like that. Uh, Buddhism was very popular around here. And it stayed that way. <laughs> My chair's so squeaky to it. It stayed that way until the year 1204 when the greed expeditions arrived. Um, this was a Muslim group from what is now Afghanistan that started sweeping through here and bringing Islam to the region. Um, this area was eventually taken over by the Delhi Sultanate, a ruling class of Muslims, and um, slowly but surely Islam sank its teeth into this country and has been ever since. It's a very, very, um, Islamic-dominated country today. Um, in 1352, the Bengal Sultanate formed, so they had their own rulers, and um, it was during this era that the economy of Bangladesh really started flourishing. It was known as the breadbasket of India. Um, it grew lots and lots of food, um, and lots and lots of trade. You know, it was just, um, like the most valuable region of India. Um, that didn't change in the 17th century, now I'm jumping way ahead, but this is a condensed version, um, when the Mughal Empire of India eventually absorbed this region. Um, during the height of that empire, um, this area, Bengal area, was the most profitable, the most valuable region. Um, you know, it, the region that really sustained the rest of the empire. Um, and it was by far the wealthiest as well. Um, eventually, this area became known as the Nawab of Bengal. Uh, the Nawab being the term for the rulers. Like saying, like, the kingdoms ruled by a king, the Nawab. 
so on and so forth. And it was also during this time that the Portuguese started setting up settlements along this area down here. Um, they had good relations with the Portuguese while they were here. Um, the Portuguese um, kind of came and went in a lot of regions, and um, this was no exception, but um, they were on friendly terms trading-wise because they also profited from the trade. Um, this region traded with like all over Europe. It was very valuable, especially like once tea became a thing. Explosion. Uh, but the, um, over in Europe, when the Seven Years' War broke out, the Mughal Empire sided with the French. It was a war between the British and the French. Um, they sided with the French because they were very concerned about the British expansion in this area and how much land they were gobbling up for the British, well, what would become known as the British East India Company. Um, but the British did wind up taking it over to create the British East India Company. Um, in this region, in Bangladesh, modern day, um, on June 23rd, 1757, the Battle of Plassey, the British defeated the Nawab of Bengal and officially took over this region and eventually the rest of India and made it all part of the British East India Company. There we go, finally settled on it. Um, this was very good for Britain, economically, um, but not so good for the, um, Bangladeshis. I'm trying to think of like what you would call people in this area before it was known as Bangladesh. Um, let's just say the, the Bangla people, <laughs> the Bengalis. Um, it was not good for them. In fact, there was a massive famine in 1770. Approximately 10 million people perished during that time due to just economic mismanagement. And there were a lot of rebellions against the British. Um, they took part in the Indian Revolution of 1857. Um, the British never really handle revolutions very well. It's, that's evident throughout history. Um, they, they handle it by, like, firing on protesters. Never a good idea. Um, but Britain had an idea for this whole region. It was to turn it into a crown colony of the empire, became the British Indian Empire, officially became technically part of Britain. Um, Britain came in, they built railroads, schools, you know, tried to improve the lives of the Bangladeshis, and, you know, in a way they did, in a way they didn't. Um, particularly in 1905, they um, shuffled around the territories here. And for this region, um, well, they made West Bengal, which you can still see, um, all of this here is West Bengal. And this became East Bengal and Assam, Assam being this region up here in India. And, um, one of the reasons that they made a West and East was that West was primarily Hindu, East was primarily Muslim. Uh, but no one in East Bengal was pleased with this arrangement. There were a lot of backlash against it um, from both Hindus and Muslims not wanting to be segregated, worried about representation. Um, the British very much favored um, Hindu leaders and politicians over Muslims. As an example, there were a lot of reasons people are upset. Um, it got to the point where Britain changed it in 1912 and just made it East Bengal, primarily Muslim area. Um, obviously that still didn't, you know, fix the problems, but <laughs> you know how it is. Um, in the early 1900s, there was a huge independence movement in this whole region of India, very famously in India, but here as well, you know, because they wanted the correct representation. They wanted independence. Um, many Muslim leaders formed their organizations um, to make sure that their voices were heard. Um, eventually, a legislature was formed in 1937 with a prime minister appointed. Very political. Um, Britain finally, you know, after World War II, decided to let a lot of their territories go and leave themselves. Um, in 1947, um, 
British India, you know, let this area go and partitioned it really interestingly. So, um, Pakistan, way over here, was still part of the, the whole colony. So what they did was they had India, primarily Muslim region, and then they separated West Pakistan and East Pakistan, because they thought, well, these, both these regions have many, many Muslims, why not make, like, the Muslim country and the Hindu country? Um, big problem with that, um, just because two people have the same religion on paper doesn't mean that they're anything alike, um, and particularly people over in West Pakistan spoke Urdu, people here spoke Bangla or Bengali, they're completely different languages, completely different cultures, um, completely different infrastructures, just in two entirely different regions completely. The only thing that they really shared was that they were both technically Muslim. Um, the people here were not very pleased about being part of Pakistan. Um, for a lot of reasons, people got very, very annoyed and wanted to break away. Um, just as for a few examples, um, West Pakistan spent the most money on West Pakistan, didn't really give a lot of money. East Pakistan, even though East Pakistan was the one making all the money from all of their exports. Um, they also had very little representation in government. Um, like for every hundred politicians, maybe four or five were from East Pakistan. It was, you know, the military, um, only 10% of it were from East Pakistan. Like very little representation in every aspect of government. Um, they also, I'll save that for last, um, there was very sadly a huge cyclone in 1970 that killed around 500,000 people and, um, they needed, you know, aid and they were not happy with West Pakistan's slow and poor response. Um, they, uh, they, West Pakistan banned a lot of um, Bangla music and literature in the media. They try to change the official language of Pakistan to Urdu, um, including over here, where pretty much nobody spoke that language. Um, but what really um, was the very last straw was that um, the leader of one of their polit political parties, the Awami League, which is important later. Um, his name was Sheikh Mujibir Rahman, um, won the election in 1970 to become the Prime Minister of Pakistan, but West Pakistan said, um, no, he, he can't do it. Like, obviously there's election fraud and he's not the Prime Minister, which people were very outraged by. There were lots and lots of protests, um, lots of rallies, um, lots of, um, yeah, like, lots of, like, big speeches about, you know, needing to be their own country. Um, they raised the Bangladesh flag, um, on March 23rd, 1971. Just a few days later, um, West Pakistan, um, decided to stop this movement the, the bad way by, um, coming in and attacking people a big independence war broke out and um, the Pakistan military um, basically launched a genocide, to put things bluntly. Um, there were many slaughters of students, protesters, they had arrested Sheikh Mujibir Rahman being, you know, held in West Pakistan. And um, because of all the atrocities happening, there was a huge international backlash. Um, in particular, I need to mention because I'm a big Beatles fan, um, George Harrison organized a big um, benefit concert for Bangladesh. Um, I believe it was like the first ever benefit concert, like ever. We started off a whole wave of benefit concerts. Um, but it really came to a head when um, 
the guerrilla army um, liberated Dhaka and um, you know we're making headway around here so the Pakistan military started um, you know attacking very close to the border of India India decided to retaliate um, and once India was on Bangladesh's side it was all over <laughs> and Pakistan surrendered on December 16th 1971 um, Bangladesh, you know, picked itself up as best it could. Um, however, there was a massive famine in 1974. Um, not entirely because of the civil war, the Bra Brahmaputra River flooded and, you know, devastated a lot of the crops. Um, but also there was a lot of political corruption. Um, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman became the prime minister. And, um, he's known as, like, the father of Bangladesh. He's a very beloved figure. Um, but he decided to deal with a lot of the turmoil by, um, changing the constitution, establishing a one-party socialist government, um, censoring the media, which, um, in my country series, pretty much any time a leader decides to do that, bad things happen, and they certainly did. Um, he was assassinated on August 15th, 1975, in a coup. Um, they were led, the country was led by a military junta until 1977. Um, a military chief stepped up as president, uh, but he was later assassinated in 1981. You know, that the, the government that was established after that was overthrown in a coup in 1982. Uh, martial law was imposed until 1986, um, and then finally things kind of got normal, politically <laughs> normal. Um, in 1991, um, Begum Khaled Azia was elected the prime minister. She was actually the wife of that military chief that was assassinated after the first coup, um, becoming, you know, the first prim female prime minister of Bangladesh. In the next elections in 1996, um, Sheikh Hasina was elected prime minister. Um, she was, she's the daughter of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. So, um, interesting. These two women have gone back and forth in elections, um, holding power. Um, Sheikh Hasina has been the prime minister since 2009. She's still prime minister to this day. And there's been a lot of, um, possible election fraud, but it's never really been proven. Um, you know, Sheikh Hasina has overwhelmingly won elections before, but, um, for the most part, the democracy is stable. There's many threats to it, but, um, stable for the most part. <laughs> As I'm recording this, the, um, the coup in Myanmar is going on, so that's always in the back of my mind, especially since I did a whole series on Myanmar. there's an election in November. Let's see how that goes. And now all this has happened. I feel like I cursed them, which I don't mind. Um, the only few things that have really threatened the stability of Bangladesh, besides the uh, floods, you know, any kind of storms, um, the Himalayas being up here, um, this area is very prone to earthquakes. You know, a, a devastating earthquake can happen any day, which, me living in San Francisco, I know that feeling. There was a radical Islamic group that sprung up in Bangladesh um, that conducted um, quite a few really terrible terrorist attacks and bombing threats throughout the 2000s, the last one being in Dhaka in 2016. Um, the Rohingya refugee crisis um, affected Bangladesh because um, over here, at the border was where the refugees fled. This is very near their province where they lived and were being removed, let's say. Um, so millions of refugees fled into Bangladesh, which is already such a highly densely populated, that's the word I was looking for, the highest population density. God, it's already a very highly populated country, so adding a few million refugees doesn't help. Um, also in 2018, Khaled Azia 
uh, was sentenced to prison for embezzling money from an orphanage, which sounds like, like something that a cartoon villain would do, but it really happened. She's still imprisoned to this day, and now it's early 2021. She was sentenced to 17 years. And that's where, um, Bangladesh is. Um, let me show you some pictures, because it, it really truly is a very beautiful country. And I know I say that for every country. It's just that the earth is very beautiful. All of it's very lovely. So let's look at some pictures. Let's see. This is the, um, um, this is a, a business building here with this really cool statue. And you can see a rickshaw down here. One of the many modes of public transit in Bangladesh. So it's a really cool picture of like modern day. Let's see, we have, um, picture from the world's longest beach. And here's a picture of the flag. Let's read this, the flag of Bangladesh. The national Bangladeshi flag was adopted on January 13th, 1972. Bangladesh separated from West Pakistan on March 26, 1971, and officially became an independent nation on December 16th, 1971. The flag is green, with a red circle positioned just left to the center of the flag. What's it saying here? It doesn't. They do that so that when the flag is raised and waving, it looks like it's center. The red circle symbolizes both the rising sun of a new country and the bloodshed during Bangladesh's fight for freedom in the Liberation War. The green background is significant for two reasons. First, Islam is the state religion in Bangladesh, and green is the color of Islam. Green is also supposed to represent the rich plant life in the country. Awesome. Here's a picture of Dhaka big city. See the water there. Here's Cox's Bazaar. Very beautiful. This is the national flower of Bangladesh, the water lily. Very pretty. And here are some rhesus monkeys. Probably one of my favorite monkeys, to be honest. Let's see. Ooh, this is a really cool picture of Emperor Akbar, one of the uh, very famous Mughal emperors. It's a really pretty picture. I love Indian art. This is a um, monument to those who died during the Great Mutiny of 1857, one of those rebellions I told you about. This is, um, it says, ethnic Bengalis making tea boxes under the direct supervision of a British official. Here's a picture of, um, probably who was president at the time that this book came out. Sorry, I keep leaning away from my microphone. And, um, this is, um, Begum Kalevizia, right here. I think, yeah, she was prime minister when this book over here we can see um, Sheikh Hasina, the current Prime Minister. This is the Parliament building, and um, the President at the time this book came out. Oh, this is cool. So this is jute, what jute looks like when it's growing and being harvested. So another one of those watery crops, so Bangladesh is perfect for and of course, there's also a very large fishing industry as well, being so close to the ocean, having all of that water there. Let's see, here's some girls going to school. It says three Hindu girls posed with their Muslim friend. And family day at the beach. There's some college students and some little kids. at school. Doesn't look like they're having a, a good day at school today, but this is an adult school for women. It says it's a literacy class. Oh, this is pretty. This is the Baitul. There we go. <laughs> there we go. The Baitul Mukran Mosque in Dhaka, which is very, very This is, it says, um, 
because tensions still exist between Bangladesh's Muslim majority and its Hindu minority, security forces are often present at major Hindu festivals. And then there's a Buddhist monk, because there are Buddhists there as well. An example of newspapers, and here's Mahatma Gandhi with um, Rabindranath Tagore. I'm sure I said his name wrong, which I apologize. He's like a really beloved, um, literal, li literal. He's a very beloved, um, historical writer, um, of literature in Bangladesh. And I believe, from what I remember, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature as well. Here's some instruments. We've got, of course, a sitar, some drums, a beautiful, beautiful dance they have. It says this dance is about catching fish, which makes sense. Let's see. Little villages in the countryside. This is the National Museum of Bangladesh. Some girls jumping rope men drinking tea. Cricket is the most popular sport in Bangladesh. Uh, but the national sport is kabaddi, which, when you break it down, is like um, tag with specific rules. It sounds really fun, though. It's like capture the flag without any flags. This is a really pretty picture. Um, this is Muslims praying. Um, Eid al Fatir. It's a really nice picture. I like that. Um, this is a celebration of Victory Day every December 16th. Mm. Making some paratha flatbread and some yummy samosas. Yum, yum. Here's an example of crowds. Bangladesh is very congested. Big cities. Here are some rickshaws transporting people. And also, of course, um, boats and ferries are a very popular way to get around Bangladesh because as you can see, there are lots and lots and lots of waterways all around the country. Um, it says here in the caption that this is actually a, a trade going on in the boats. That so much of Bangladeshi life takes place on waterways that they can even do trade. Some yummy looking melons. Here's a textile factory. Um, and here's actually a protest uh, for workers' rights at textile factory. Gorgeous, gorgeous pottery. Look at that, how beautiful. So let's see this picture. It says Bangladeshis have many everyday uses for baskets. These villagers in Silhet are using baskets to carry their belongings while they cling to the top and back of a minibus. That's a good picture too. I like that. A busy school. I wonder why they're holding those up. They're doing some kind of science experiment. Um, here's the baby getting their vaccinations. This is neat. Some of the archaeological sites. This is Lal Bagh Fort. Um, I don't read about it. It's a very beautiful ancient mosque. And, um, here's another mosque in Bagarhat. The Sheikh Gumbaj. I'm probably saying it wrong. Lots of ancient mosques around here. This is Sheikh Mujib Rahman returning from uh, prison after the country is liberated. And uh, here he is again. Um, this is apparently a, a shell oil worker because um, lots of oil reserves have been found off the coast. And this is a 
protest against it. Um, I should have looked up and seen how that's going, but I'm pretty sure that it's not going as much as it, um, you know, had been planning to in the past because of global warming. It's more of a focus on saving the country from being flooded than mining oil. An example of a shanty town, there is a very um, large, lower class, very impoverished population of Bangladesh. It being such a large country and all. Another picture of the traffic congestion. This is done, yeah. Oh, here's a picture of um, these men testing the water. So there are very high levels of arsenic in a lot of the water here. And um, many people get sick or die because of it, so it's important to make sure your water's clean. Rice field and a tea field. Picking tea leaves. Making me thirsty. Another example of rickshaws, and some cities like to paint and decorate their rickshaws and make them really pretty. Here's a royal Bengal tiger in the Sundarbans which I'll have a whole video about them, these amazing creatures. Here's an example of mangrove trees. So their, their roots grow out all under the water like this. And this is obviously low tide because normally at high tide, this would all be covered up. Fabric shops, it's textiles, such a huge industry there. Let's see, oh, it's just an example of saris. This is a, um, let's see, it says the economy of Bangladesh's tribal peoples is heavily based on agriculture. So it's like a market day or something. And this is a member of the Marma tribe. This man is preparing bamboo strips for the building of more huts. This is an International Women's Day march um, for survivors of acid burns, which also see a picture here of people speaking out against acid attacks, which is a really horrendous thing to happen to a woman. My goodness, it's awful. Here's a giant picture of Bill Clinton. <laughs> There's something we don't see every day. <laughs> There's um, Sheikh Hasina with um, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Dennis G. Reinhardt. So this is here because Bill Clinton visited the country during his presidency. Oh, here we go. There's Bill Clinton visiting the country, and this says it's, um, these are Bangladeshi units of the UN, um, training near the Iraq-Kuwait border. Um, congressman from the United States with the U.S. ambassador to Bangladesh. This is a, um, human chain protest in 2001 that were protesting against the uh, radical Islams, the, the radical Islamic terrorists, um, um, trying to make sure that there were no representatives getting elected into the government. An example of Lon Shop down there. We have the Canadian Secretary of State for Asia and the Pacific. Lots of um, speakers here for the Green Umbrella Campaign. Um, let me see, it says a reproductive health program, which um, there's only one woman on this apparently, which tells you all you need to know. More United States people are representing Bangladesh, we don't need to see them. A picture of um, a Bangladesh restaurant region in New York City. Um, a student in America from Bangladesh. Um, you know, there's a very large population of Bangladeshis who work internationally and send money back to Bangladesh. Another way to get money into the economy. Detailed map of the regions here. Another shot of the markets. And I think, ooh, I think that's it for the book. Oh yeah, there's a picture of a cool boat. And I believe that Oh, this is cool. Beautiful market. Example of their currency. And that's all. So, that's it for now. 
I have lots of really great videos planned for you about Bangladesh. So please stick around, join me for that. Subscribe so you don't miss out. They're going to come out every day, as long as everything goes well. And I thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it relaxing and educational. And I hope you have a very good, good, good night. Good night.